One of the best ways to learn how garments were made in the past is to study surviving examples of those garments. Today we'll be examining this lovely example of Edwardian underwear. I think this is a combination corset cover and petticoat, because the fullness of the lace yoke could easily conceal the ridges of a corset underneath. And it's too long to just be a chemise. It's made of a lightweight cotton fabric, kind of in between a modern broadcloth and lawn. I think it was made between 1900 and 1910, based on examples I saw in magazines, sewing manuals, and catalogs. Those other early 1900s combinations featured ribbons threaded through the lace embellishments. So with some silk ribbon and a blunt needle, I recreated the ribbon trim this garment would have had a hundred years ago. Let's dive into the details of these antique Edwardian combinations, starting at the top and working our way down. Each sleeve is made of five strips of delicate lace that have been sewn together. It's interesting that some of the lace has a straight edge on both sides, and some of the lace has a scalloped edge. The laces were overlapped slightly and stitched together by machine. Contrasting gray thread was actually used on one of the sleeves. It's unclear if this was an original compromise or a later alteration, but it's interesting to see nonetheless. There's a very narrow French seam along the underarm of the sleeves, and it appears that the front and back of the garment were assembled before the side seams were sewn. Like the sleeves, the yoke is made from strips of lace sewn together. However, here the maker has used alternating rows of machine-made whitework embroidery and lace insertion. The bottom of the yoke has been slightly gathered and sewn to what I believe is called beading lace. I love looking at the seams of old garments for clues as to how these clothes were actually sewn together. The seam allowances on the lace insertion and the yoke have been simply pressed to one side and stitched down by machine. I wonder if this piece was made in a factory or by a skilled but speedy home sewist. There is a placket about 17 inches long at the front of the combinations. The placket has an extra flap that hides the buttons underneath, which is a pity because these teeny tiny mother of pearl buttons are adorable. The combinations fasten with five of these buttons and machine sewn buttonholes. To achieve the princess line shape as they called it during the Edwardian period, the fitted panels of fabric are sewn together with six rather sloppy French seams. Interestingly, it looks like the combinations were assembled, then lace was sewn onto the neckline, and then the French seams were made at the back of the garment. Notice how tiny the stitches are. I think sewing machines from the early 1900s just had a much shorter stitch length than our modern machines do. Looks like the original maker also struggled with their sewing machine tension that day. I wonder if the sloppy, uneven seam finishing indicates that this was a mass-produced garment. The combinations are finished off with a delicate ruffle at the hem. The hem ruffle is embellished with five 1 8 of an inch wide pin tucks, rows of insertion lace, and whitework embroidery. Note how the side seams of the combinations weren't perfectly aligned, those pin tucks don't match up. The fabric of the ruffle is actually more lightweight and sheer than the fabric that the rest of the combinations was made of. The ruffle is barely gathered. It's not much wider than the upper portion of the combinations. The circumference of the ruffle is 68 inches, but the circumference of the combinations is 61 inches. I wonder if this narrow circumference is a clue that this undergarment was made towards the later part of the Edwardian era, when silhouettes became more slim. Think Titanic or Downton Abbey styles. The ruffle was sewn to the right side of the combinations, and then a narrow strip of matching bias cut fabric was used to cover the seam allowances on the inside. Now what are some tips and takeaways from this piece that we can apply to our own historical sewing? First of all, don't be afraid to mix and match materials. The original maker combined different kinds of lace and trim that didn't always match, 
where they didn't have this straight-sided lace, they used scalloped lace, and in the end it doesn't even matter. They even took advantage of a lighter weight fabric on the ruffle, and from first glance you wouldn't even notice, but it works wonderfully. Also, don't be afraid to use your sewing machine. This entire garment is machine sewn. I think sometimes we get the idea that all historic clothing was sewn by hand, and this delicate lacy underwear was meticulously stitched in some Parisian workroom, but that wasn't always the case. This was made in an era when clothing mass manufacturing was already firmly in place, and I think we see some of those mass manufacturing techniques in this example. Also, if you're using a sewing machine in your historic sewing, reduce the stitch length. As we saw, the stitches that were produced by machines from the early 1900s were much smaller than the stitches that come as the default size in our modern sewing machines, so just knock down that dial a little bit to more closely approximate the effect of antique clothes. I have other antique undergarments in my collection, so please let me know if there's anything in particular you'd like to see. Let me know in the comments down below what is your favorite detail in this antique corset cover petticoat combinations garment. And if you enjoyed watching this video, please leave a like. If you want to see more content like this, please subscribe to my channel and thank you so much for watching.